Before we start, I just wanted to jump in and let you know that in January in 2023, I'm running an effective teaching conference. I'm bringing together a whole bunch of educators who are absolutely amazing at their job to help us make 2023 our most effective year as presenters. I'll be presenting. I've got Jay McTee who wrote Understanding by Design. I've got John Hattie and a whole bunch of others who are coming to present and help us to become effective teachers. This is an international conference. I've tried to pick a time that works across as many time zones as possible. So it will be very accessible for everyone and I've decided to make it as cheap as possible as well. So I literally, it's a $2 conference. So if you've got a spare $2, you can register. The conference goes for five days and they're gonna have at least three people presenting each day for you guys. To You can go to every single session live, it'll be recorded. You'll be able to watch those recordings back for at least a week after the conference so that you, even if you miss it, even if you're in the UK where I don't think it really quite matches up with your time zone, you can still register and watch those videos for just $2. So head over to teacherspd.net slash conference. You can get some more details there and make sure you sign up. It is literally $2, a $2 conference. Well, hi everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for coming and joining me today. I'm going to be sitting down with my great friend, Brendan Lee. We're going to be chatting together about uh, direct instruction, explicit direct instruction. I think there's three other terms for it as well. So Brendan, I just want to thank you so much for coming and giving me your time for chatting with me today about it. And I take it that you know a lot more than this about this topic than I do, uh, because I just had a you know, a few quick questions with you before we even started and you were like listing three or four different books that you've been reading and three different styles about how you go about this approach and so i wanted to pull out as much information as i can to help people who are listening about you know how to actually do this well in terms of the, what kind of instruction is needed to actually help our students with their learning and what place it has you know i'm going to try to play a bit of a devil's advocate role as we have this chat because i want to really draw out all the misconceptions around it and all that kind of stuff. So thanks so much for coming and hanging out with me. I know it's late in the evening for you and <laughs> for me. Yeah, all good. Always uh, always happy to have a chat about anything to do with education and teaching. That's fantastic. All right, Brandon. So start me off, okay? You said that there's a whole bunch of different approaches. Just give me a rough outline of what you do. Whether I, like, I'm going to call it explicit direct instruction, but I have a feeling that's actually a technical term. Let's go with direct instruction, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you use? Like, what's your process that yeah. you would use in your classroom and kind of why? Why are you using that process? You know, the way I look at um, education and, and you talk to any teacher, they'll tell you how um, busy they are, how time poor they are, and that they're struggling to fit the curriculum in. And so for me, I'm going to use the term explicit instruction to start off with. <laughs> and just That's to confuse right. you, I'll change explicit it later on. <laughs> no, yeah, explicit instruction is probably like the the kind of overlaying uh, term that, that that everything else would fall under. So explicit instruction. And, and the reason why I, would, I use it is because it's the most effective and efficient way of teaching uh, something new to students. So whether it's uh, how to do something, whether it is, you know, so that procedural or it's new new information. Yeah, explicit instruction is, is all about, yeah, giving them that knowledge that they need and finding those connections to help them understand what you're trying to deliver. Okay, so we're looking to make connections, which rings bells for me. I'm like, right, that's how we learn. We need to make the new knowledge connect to what we already have. Yeah. What are you doing actually in your class. So let's say you're teaching a new topic to your students. I'm, I'm interested you said for new topics, does it work for old, for like uh, going deeper with stuff like that? Because in from what I've read, I understand it works really great when you're learning something really that's new and you have to come up with that new kind of yeah. connections and you're getting new content or something or a new skill. Yeah. Once you've kind of learned that skill, you can go up into deeper learning or you want to actually do a whole bunch of application or something with it. Do you yeah. still use a lot of explicit instruction you would initially yeah so you know like learning is, is just so complex and i think one of the things that we forget as teachers is just how little knowledge our students have you know and, and so we suffer from what's called the curse of knowledge where you know like we know so much and so then when when we are teaching things to students we don't necessarily give them enough time for them to actually develop anywhere near the level of expertise that, that they need to have, you know. So, like, if we are looking at things like inquiry learning or project-based learning, 
you know, if you think about all of the different bits of knowledge that you need to do that properly. So you need to know, firstly, you know, how to research properly, what you're going to research. You need to have an understanding on, you know, at least a, a broad overview of what that topic is so that you can type in the right words. You need to be able to analyse what the search results are and figure out, well, you know, what is it that uh, I'm looking at now and how will I know that that's a trustworthy source? You know, see, I know that you've spoken a lot about this stuff in the past. Where, where I guess explicit instruction comes into this is that you're explicitly teaching all of that stuff first. You know, so before just sending them in to go and do that, you know, you need to teach them that background knowledge first. So you're teaching that to them rather than spending time on, on saying, you know, um, what do you think about this before you've even taught it? Uh, so um, it's all about like, it's rather, you know, like I know a lot of the, the kind of, people who are against explicit instruction or direct instruction, that they're kind of saying, oh, we don't want the chalk and talk and the, the teacher out the front um, lecturing to the class. And, and I 100% agree. And that's not what explicit instruction is. You, Yes, you are delivering information, but then you're constantly checking for understanding at the same time. And so, for example, you know, you might you might start something off and then you, you might do like a um, using your mini whiteboards or uh, you might ask a multiple choice question or, or a, um, thumbs up, thumbs down, a check for understanding. And it's like this constant back and forth. And so I think that what you need to understand is, is you're using those principles of cognitive load theory so that you're sequencing everything that you do in really small steps. So rather than going, you know, and I'll, I'll give you an example. So we've been looking at, um, I've, I've been doing some professional learning on mathematics. And like one of the issues that a lot of our teachers have is that they go from, they'll do like a model at the start and then send the students straight off into doing their independent practice. But the students haven't actually understood what you've shown them initially. And so we actually need to have a whole lot of extra steps in between before you get to that independent practice. And so this is where like your worked examples come in and your scaffolding and backwards fading and all So these different techniques where basically you're slowly taking away the steps and you're, you're gradually releasing that support that you initially give them before they go into that independent practice. But yeah, you know, like, you know, what we find is that there's just, there's a lot more knowledge that our students need before they, they can go into that independence. And then a lot of times we, we probably underestimate that and, you know, basically set our students up for failure. And, you know, that's, that's kind of why you know, I'm a big believer in this, this sort of mode of teaching. Yeah, and I think part of what you've said there sounds a lot like it's a very old school method of whole part whole, which you take the whole skill, like with your math thing, if they're doing the whole thing, they're showing them the whole thing. But yeah. then... It's like they've missed the part where that you break it down into its steps and you're checking each of those steps as you go. And Dylan William will talk about the idea of a pivot, or I call them a pin, pivot or a hinge uh, yes. kind of task where yeah. you're actually asking the kids, really like it should be something that's short and sweet that just checks that they actually understood what was explained or they have grasped something before you then move on in your lesson. And that hinge actually determines, well, if the kids all get it wrong i've got to go back and do something else yeah. uh, whereas if they get it right you're kind of opening a door to two different pathways to go ahead in your lesson and if you're really good at differentiation you can then have you know the ones who get it right go off onto that, that activity the ones who get it wrong go onto this activity or a new way of you explaining it or whatever it is that that's going to happen so yeah. so uh, just going back to that point it's actually more about rather than if you do this properly you actually don't have to differentiate as much it's more about you just release students at different stages so you have your scaffolded support and so you're slowly taking away those steps rather than having different tasks for different groups yeah but differentiation doesn't mean that there has to be a different task like scaffolding yeah. something and allowing the students to go off or use it as much as they need to use that is for me differentiation like i, I think differentiation if you yeah. make differentiation always different tasks yeah that's that's hard uh, it gets very complex for a teacher to manage 10 yeah. different tasks that are happening in their room at the same time. But even just by building in student choice, like, there's so many ways to, to do it. But let's come back to our explicit instruction. Yeah. So you've got a new bit of content you're going to teach in your class. Yeah. Walk me through, you know, what are the things, what, what are your steps for how you're going to go through? So if you're doing your math stuff, how are you going to go through and teach this using explicit instruction 
in a way that then has our students able to do the independent stuff that you said they were getting to too early? I don't think it's too different to what most teachers do. I just think a lot of teachers don't like to be labelled as someone that's doing explicit instruction, to be honest. You know, so what would I do? I would be plan in my planning phase, I'd be thinking about well what what are some common misconceptions? You know, what are some tricky areas uh, in, you know, whether it's a word problem or whatever it is that we're looking at, you know, so what things do they need to know? What things do they need to look out for? You know, in, before we even kind of enter that. And, and if I know that I haven't taught something there, then that's what I'm going to start with. So I'm going to actually teach them if, if we're looking at a word problem and then there's, there's some sort of mul multiplicative thinking that they need to do and I haven't taught that strategy yet, I'm going to teach that first rather than throwing the problem to them and seeing if they can figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Now, devil's advocate here. Yeah. What's wrong with letting the kids try and work it out? Like, doesn't that help them to develop their, you know, problem-solving skills and all that kind of stuff? Are you kind of skipping that step of them being able to be kind of authentic learners in that sense of I'm lost and I've got to work out what I need to do to try and solve the problem in front of me? I think you you kind of you can underestimate how difficult things are, and like there's a lot of things that kind of come into play here. So the first thing is is that like success breeds success, you know. So say if we are sticking on um, maths, right? We already know that a lot of students have a negative sense of self when it comes to their ability in mathematics. Okay, and so for me, I don't really want to make them struggle and, and make them fail at things when I know that I can just teach it to them in the first place. Yeah, there's going to be times where you're still going, you, you know, you might throw a question at them and, and see if they can do it. But if I was going to do that, firstly, I'd make sure that I've set up the classroom culture right first so that they understand that, you know, this is a classroom where, you know, it's okay to fail and make mistakes. It's all part of the learning process. But again, it comes back to my thing about, you know, being efficient and effective. The most efficient and effective way is just to teach them that in the first place. You know, like if you look at a lot of that that mathematics stuff and even and and it doesn't have to be maths, but it can be anything. It can be really difficult to know, you know, like you need knowledge to gain knowledge. And, and what we're actually doing is that we're actually increasing that educational gap because we're then not allowing our students who are from low SES families who haven't got the vocabulary, they haven't been exposed to that, you know, the broader life experiences that your kids and my kids have been exposed to. And so for me, it's also an equity issue, you know, if we're not actually teaching them things and then we're, we're just saying, use your life experiences, well, a lot of them, they haven't got a lot of life, life experiences. It, it also kind of cuts that away as well by just, yeah, it, teaching it to them. Okay, so you talked a lot there about helping lower socioeconomic status and really bridging that gap that exists. Yeah. But then what are you doing to the old, like the ones who actually have got it? Let's like, in terms of your differentiation of what's happening in your class, if you've got students, you really stand there and give explicit instruction to teach something. Yeah. Like you've got half a class that actually already know how to do that. Yeah. So well, you still go through your process of explicit instruction or does something else happen? Because I, I know you're trying to bridge this gap and catch up the lowest socioeconomic status yeah. or the kids who just have that knowledge gap that needs to be bridged the ones who already have that knowledge though are they going to be held back because you're doing explicit instruction or is there something else that you do very dependent on where you're at but in general like a lot of our kids actually they, they don't have the depth of knowledge that you actually think that they do and so it's not actually going to do them a lot of harm by going over it again in some cases you know if they really do have that expertise yeah then you, you just send them off and they can go get started 100%. But I think a lot of the times what when you are starting, you know, a new concept and even if kids do have some level of, of background knowledge in it, it's not going to do them a lot of harm by actually you know, going over it again. And, and it's also part of retrieval practice and at the same time, you know, because a lot of schools and a lot of teachers, they haven't actually got that sort of system set in place where you're explicitly planning when you're going to do your, your retrieval practice and, and you've spaced that out purposefully and you know and yeah uh, yeah quite often when i run my professional development talk a lot about retrieval practice like it's a, it's a very big thing for students to be able to develop that knowledge uh, and to be able to remember and recall specific pieces of information or skill processes and that kind of stuff it's part of explicit instruction then <laughs> yes that's yeah that's that's it i like you know explicit yeah. instruction 
yeah. mentioned at the beginning you don't start by going you know what do you know about this but it yeah. sounds like you kind of do a little bit in the sense no, you do well so like in the you were asking me you know if we're starting um a new concept how would i teach it but if you're starting a lesson yeah, a lot of times you're going to start with like a daily review or, um, you know, and so with Rosenstein's principles on instruction. Like review or recall? Well, I'll go, I'll go. Over review your... sounds like you're going to, exp- you're going to say it again. Yeah. Uh, so and for me, that's not helping the students if I tell them what we did last, yes, last lesson no. or last week. Yeah. So uh, there's, so again, like, yeah, if you, I, I really advise you to, to read into Rosenstein's principles of instruction. That's probably like the easiest one to kind of enter into he basically looked at 40 years worth of um studies looking at explicit instruction so it's called here rosenstein's principles of instruction um tom sherrington's published a book uh rosenstein's principles in action and so basically yeah like three of his uh, actual principles they look at retrieval practice and so there's one which is and like the the wording you can change the wording or whatever but there's like there's daily review weekly reviews and monthly reviews and yeah. so it, it is um, purposely putting into, yeah, your your plan, your weekly plan or whatever, retrieval practice. And so it is when you're you're asking questions and you're checking for understanding, you're, you're asking questions that specifically look at uh, certain things that have been covered over, you know, the, the week, the year, the term, the month, whatever. So it's really kind of space recall then. I could yeah. like the word review, I think of someone presenting and yeah. advising by yeah. like presenting the content in a summary yeah. format or something. the principles of instruction uh basically it's looking at cognitive science but putting it into practical terms for teachers to use so yeah that's that's what it is yeah yeah i definitely i love reading all the cognitive science side of stuff and yeah, yeah i've got great authors that i really love listening to like jim, jim quick i love most teachers have no idea who he is <laughs> when i talk about him but I mean, he's a, a memory expert and he talks about you know, space retrieval. Uh, he just he, but like he uses slightly different language because he doesn't use the word review. He thinks a review like, like that's why I, when I hear the word review, I'm like, I mean, someone's giving me a summary. Whereas what you're actually in my head, what you sounds like you're meeting is the idea of actually spacing out, getting kids to recall and checking that they still have that ability to recall, and that then leads into the review afterwards. Like if they don't get it right, yeah. uh, there'll be some kind of review afterwards because they can't yeah. retrieve it. You know, like there's there's a whole lot of techniques that are, that that can be used um, in explicit instruction or direct instruction. So, I kind of I briefly mentioned it before, but you know, doing a lot of quizzes is is really a big part of of explicit instruction and getting like getting students actively thinking. That, that's what it's about. It's about not just having one or two students thinking, not just the teacher doing the thinking. Um, but it's having all students thinking. And so how do they do that? They do things like, you know, checking for understanding. So checking for understanding is not just asking questions, but asking questions to all the students. You know, so you might have heard of some of Doug Mobb's techniques, which can come into play here as well. And so that's things like cold calling where um, you ask a question and, and you, you're not accepting hands up. So you're yep. picking non-volunteers. Um, another big, big part of... Uh, direct instruction and explicit instruction is uh, doing like pair shares. Mm-hmm. So again, it's all about activating them as as learners. So rather than just having one student responding, you're actually giving all of your students opportunities to respond and to talk. You know, so you just, you basically, like I said before, it's just all about putting into practice everything to do with cognitive science and, and what we know about learning, you know, like, you, you can't learn if you're not actively engaged and thinking about you know the content if you're not doing that nothing's going to happen it doesn't matter how great you, you're teaching and so that's why there's constantly checking for understanding to check that students are taking in the messages that you're delivering and and if you need to you need to reteach or you need to use a different analogy or a different story to help them connect to to the message that you're giving okay now I'm going to have people on this is devil's advocate stuff again. So we've talked a lot about it being, you know, it's cognitively science based yeah. process, lots of recall stuff that's built in through this, plenty of checking for understanding and formative assessment type stuff with yeah. explicit instruction where you're expressly teaching skills or you're expressly teaching content to your students and then checking that they're getting it, you're breaking it down into those smaller chunks to really make sure that they actually get the whole kind of thing. Yeah. And, when we shift then, like, is there a process in explicit direction where you then shift into 
the kind mm-hmm. of larger project type stuff or into the more independent students working through problems or working through you know their own critical analysis of something you know, i've taught the skills now through explicit instruction of critical analysis yeah and now do i just kind of like what's the next step there how, how do you do that transition into what often gets called the deeper learning or you know if you're still using blooms it's at the top of the pyramid like yeah. Does that still happen or like, yeah, that kind of like icing on the cake or what like what's no it's, it's definitely a part of it you know independent is a huge part independent practice is a huge part of it and and you know what we know about learning is that if you don't actually get that time to practice it it's it's not you're not going to get it ingrained into your long-term memory and so the kind of the number that we kind of aim for is 80 percent so once you're kind of getting 80 percent of the questions correct then you, you move into that independent practice phase or inquiry learning or whatever it is that you're going to do next uh yeah definitely and and, and again like I, I do want to address that misconception as well is that it's not like you do one or the other you know i think a lot of teachers they they, they seem to have this um they they get their you know their chest out when people say that you're doing this and you're not doing that and I'm like no you can still do that and if you look at the best project-based learning kind of scaffolds of, of doing it properly you know i think it's a gold is it the gold-based standard one gold standards yeah gold standard one you'll see that that it's actually they're doing explicit instruction at the start that's what they're doing yeah yeah you know? oh, it's definitely in there like for for your inquiries your projects your problem they all everyone who has really set up scientifically based processes for that which have great results all talk about the idea of there still being explicit instruction yeah. Uh, even for like me, when I like I listen to all your what you're talking about here and I just go, it's exactly what we do in flipped learning. Like yeah. I'm not necessarily standing at the front of the classroom doing the conversation, explicit instruction, explaining stuff and checking, but I actually build that into my videos that I make. And yeah. so when I would do flip learning, the kids would watch my video halfway, like they get part way through, it would stop and ask them a question to check their understanding. They wouldn't be able to keep going unless they got it right. So they have to go back and rewatch it. Yeah. and all that kind of stuff and then when they come into my classroom i can see like what they got on that kind of a quiz that they did throughout the video and stuff and i would use that to then determine where they go whether they need further explicit instruction from me and in a small group kind of setting and yeah. i free up the other ones to then go and do further work and i do i use that 80 percent cutoff is what it's also what they use in that in a lot of the vet subjects you know you have to get 80 percent in your yeah. in your quizzes or your exams for that in order to be competent yeah. And it's that almost a, like a mastery based approach there where you're going, you've got to get this basis right before you can move on. And yeah, you know, I remember even when I was reading Hattie's kind of first books when they first came out, mm. he has a lot of stuff in there about the benefits of explicit instruction, uh, particularly for you know the, this large effect size he has, right? Yeah. Uh, and that effect size is always biggest yeah it's at the beginning of content like if you're presenting something new you test the kids beforehand and they're going to get almost nothing you test them later they get great results just from explicit instruction because that's what they need when they're getting the basis when they're getting that first kind of you know we're building our connections we're showing them how things work we're breaking it down into its parts but they're also seeing it how it fits into the bigger picture so they can identify the key pieces that they need to pull out and put back together there's so much that flows into explicit instruction that then is required for you know your inquiry based learnings your project based learnings I mean, the only slight differences really that might be is that the project is the center that that comes through but there still is explicit instruction you know the whole way through. Should be. that's yeah. right yeah think, you're, you know, not it, you're, you're not meeting the gold standard like it's it's in the gold standards of yeah and, and and i think that's that's what people just need to understand is that the whole thing with inquiry learning not working is when you just go and say to the kids off you go before you've, yeah. you've given them any knowledge any direction and even just little things like so say <clears throat> say you want to do group work right if you're taking that kind of explicit instruction approach you're explicitly teaching them how to operate in that group so what what everyone is what everyone's roles are how they're going to communicate how they're going to give each other feedback what they're actually going to be doing who has what role so that's that's being explicit you know that's what the, the word means yeah. is that you're and shifting about? things from being group work to actually being collaboration yeah, yeah. That, that's that's what you're actually training them to do yeah. through that explicit instruction and you see it in the students who don't get explicit instruction 
Yeah. And I just doing group work where they're like, I don't know what to do. You do the work. We all get the results from it or whatever. Yeah. And they don't know how to function in a group because they haven't been taught how to function. No. And particularly, you know, I you know, spent most of my life teaching high school. I now also teach my kids at home because we homeschool and they're primary school kids. And yeah. when you talk about, you know, they don't have that experience, they don't have that knowledge. It's, I see it a lot more, you know, because yeah. I'm, I'm so used to that, taking particularly senior kids. I get a lot of year 11, 12. Yeah. For most of my teaching career, the big differences in what they bring, but still, they both need that explicit instruction. I do, and, you know, and, and because I've, I've done a similar thing where I went from high school to primary, you, you can't get away with lazy teaching in, in primary school. You know, it just doesn't work. In high school, you can. And, I, you know, and I'll, I'll put my hand up and say, oh, I've done it, where you, you either do just you know, chalk and talk and lecture or you do just say to the kids, go and research this without actually giving them that their skills and knowledge that they need prop to properly do it successfully just a couple of things i just want to go over like there's a lot of nuances in this as well like in terms of the learning and so you can use things like examples and non-examples to just really show exactly what you're you're aiming for because sometimes when you're delivering a message it doesn't quite cut through exactly the way that you think it does and so you actually need to show them what it looks like and what it doesn't look like and keep going over these things as well. You know, like even even like your, your behavior norms and, and your classroom management routines that you want to have, like explicitly teaching all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just really important because a lot of the things that we take for granted are actually really complex. And, and you know, you'll start to discover this now. Like in terms of writing, writing is such a difficult skill for, for kids to master. You know, you, you've got to know how to actually handwrite, you've got to know how to spell the words, you've got to know how to structure sentences and paragraphs, then you've got to know what you're writing about, the content that you're writing about, you've got to know the audience that you're writing to. Yeah. There's so much to think about. And, and so you can extend and break the rules. <laughs> what was that? So and then at the end, how you can extend and break rules when you're writing. Exactly, <laughs> you know, and, and so all of these different things, we've actually got to teach it to them. And if we don't, that's, that's what we end up with, with kids in high school that still can't write properly, you know, and you and I, we've experienced that. Yeah, yeah. Teach them how to structure a paragraph still in year 11 and 12. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. Well, Brad, I think we're going to round up here, I think. I think it's been a great chatting with you. It's been great to enlighten me and, and other people as well, just around, you know, explicit direct, explicit instruction. I've got to get the direct out of it because it's a technical term that goes in there. So explicit instruction is not a have that and nothing else it goes into inquiry and project-based learning it also functions on its own with some basic application stuff or you know students doing their own independent work and stuff that happens out of that i hear so many of the things that i've learned through many of the other books i've read like you talked about those yeah you know, making sure you're checking for really clear misunderstandings and accounting for those and giving false examples and true examples and even dylan williams talks about how to actually structure those hinge or pivot whatever they're called questions and how to make sure that you can actually interpret those questions to know what the students actually misunderstood based on what their answers are that they give and creating those questions can be really complex but once you do the result is a really quick kind of formative assessment that happens in your lesson and it's fantastic i think to see explicit instruction happening in classrooms i think it's definitely needed across the board I don't think it should be the only thing that anyone ever does is and i'm not we're not, we're not advocating for people to stand and, and present a powerpoint the whole time we're talking about clear processes that exist for making sure students grasp new content based on cognitive science with lots of recall and checking for understanding and developing our students before we then say all right off you go and do your project or do your inquiry process do the research we actually make sure that they're prepared for that because I remember like interviewing Hattie and talking to him about stuff at one point, and he was just so clear on the fact that this explicit instruction is so needed at the beginning for students to understand and grasp and be able to develop in any area. And that's that's the bit that some people, teachers want to ditch it because they think, oh no, it's just talking at the front, but it's not, it's not what it's all about. Uh, you know, Hattie hates the idea of people talking at the front. He's got a whole app that he developed <laughs> about how to time how long you spend talking in the classroom <laughs> uh, and then how to reduce that. So you're actually getting more of the kids talking yeah. in terms of that, you know, checking for understanding and all that kind of stuff that should be happening 
and that is explicit instruction that that checking i think that's fantastic i want to thank you so much for your time for coming and explaining that and if you just brandon before you go give us a couple of books that you would recommend people go and check out if they're keen to learn more about you know, real explicit instruction and not just talking yeah. Yeah, well, as I said, there's um, Rosenstein's Principles of Instruction. There's actually a free PDF version that you can download online, and that's that's the original. You can also buy Tom Sherrington's version of um, Principles in, of Instruction in Action, which is um, basically just including uh, examples from the classroom for Rosenstein's Principles, and and so you know that's like fifteen bucks as well. So two really accessible options there, and he's got like. All of these free resources online as well. I can send you some links after this. Yeah, you know, if you're looking to get into the other um, models, like there's explicit direct instruction, which is really quite big in Australia as well, and that's by Yabara and Hollingsworth. Um, so that's another book that you can look into, and it's yeah a lot more structured with the the process. So there's a um, tapple process which they go over. Um, I won't go into it all now, but yeah. So there's there's also that one, and there's also Engelman's direct instruction, which is again a free paper but it's a lot lot more dense in reading it and so I probably wouldn't recommend people go straight to that one so start with Rosenstein's principles of instruction it's, it's the easiest one to kind of get your head around and you'll just constantly be going oh yeah I do that I do that I do that but it's also about just digging that bit bit, bit deeper as well to kind of look at well what makes this effective because I think sometimes as well we make this connection to something but then we don't necessarily know exactly what makes it work and what doesn't make it work. So I just encourage yeah, educators just to look into it properly. And yeah, I'm, I'm always open to have a chat about this stuff as well. So thanks for having me on, Dan. No, thank you so much, Brent. I'll make sure I put the links and stuff to stuff on the website with this podcast. So make sure you, I don't know how to find my podcast anymore. It used to be really easy, but now I've, I've changed my website over and I can't do the easy process. So you'll have to, subscribe and get an email from me that has the links in it that'll be, that'll be the easiest way uh, and if, on, if you're on youtube it'll be under the links will be underneath the video on youtube that that might be easier for you but thank you so much for your time thank you for explaining explicit instruction for everyone and i hope people go and learn more about how they can really leverage what they're kind of already doing and refine it so that it's better and more impactful for their students and what they're doing in their classroom thank you so much and i hope you have a lovely night Well, guys, thanks for listening. Don't forget to go and check out the Effective Teaching Conference. It's coming up in January in 2023. Go to teacherspd.net slash conference to get all the details for this $2 conference. That's right, $2 available for people all over the world, and that's $2 Australian. So if you're in the US, it's even cheaper. Come and register. I can't wait to see you there.